how does trauma affect people? Because, you know, just to kind of set up the scene a little bit, many housing officers I've dealt with over the years, you know, they'll kind of take the line that unless they can see you're visibly shaking or something, then you're OK. Um, and, and so really that's kind of, you know, in terms of our, our work as advocates or kind of support services, we need to do this kind of this background research to present this evidence to councils because they haven't got the time to find it themselves and they haven't got the motivation to find it themselves because they don't have enough TA on the day. And that's the reality of it. So with that, with that kind of definition in mind that I've put in the chat, I'm hoping that will kind of just just kind of um, flavor the kind of this subsequent conversation. So I'm just going to start off by by asking the question. <coughs> excuse me um essentially what you know what do we mean by trauma and i know lots of the people attending today will, will already kind of be you know reasonably familiar with kind of the kind of the common things most people will immediately think of physical abuse and sexual abuse and those kind of things which are obviously very prevalent but i guess the question is you know what else is kind of acting on people and what else kind of leaves people less able to deal with the system less able to deal with homelessness than your ordinary healthy and robust person would be so adrian i'm going to pick on you because we spoke last week and i know you've got a lot of stuff to say in it and then we'll just kind of hopefully just kind of free flow it yeah sure so you've <clears throat> seen hundreds of people yeah what what's your what's your what you know what's your kind of big picture take on it well i mean I, like i say uh, trauma is by far the most common factor in all the people that i see um now when we, people think of trauma, they think of specific things. They think of, like you said, abuse, or they think of accidents, or they think of this, or they think of that. Um, and while there's no sort of definition of what a traumatic event is, it's about the emotional response to the event, and people respond differently. Some people respond, you know, with a, with a more kind of, you know, with a more intense emotional thing. And that's, you know, we could all have the same experience in this room, all 200 of, of us, and, ex, you know, our emotional responses could all be different. So it's, it's about that response. Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of how it affects people and what, what I see, it's it's uh, it's um, what you said a minute ago, Mike, about people. Um, and I think Sarah said something about the absence of symptoms, the absence of things. So people who are who've been through trauma aren't always twenty four hours a day shaking and appearing to be traumatized. Okay, that doesn't mean they're not traumatized though. It's just a trigger when they're triggered, either internally, externally, I know by something that happens or thoughts. Then the kind of Things that you might expect to see: suicidal thoughts, psychosis, you know, dissociation, substance misuse, all that kicks in. But the problem is, when people see them not in that state, they assume. I hate to use the word "okay," but that's what they assume. They're okay. So, also, when someone's like that, when they're not experiencing being triggered, in my opinion, right? When they're like that, they may try to engage in housing services, but while they're not triggered. They might just assume they're okay because they have an absence they're not experiencing voices etc when they are triggered experiencing all these things they're far less likely then to try and uh, engage with housing services because they might just you know avoid situations or isolate um so they you know so then again it, it's it, you know it doesn't come into play when they're when they're dealing with with the housing situation but in terms of mental health it is by far the biggest factor um in, in, in its present past and you know continuing i mean I saw in the last two years, I saw 258 people, 220 of those had traumatic experiences they reported to me. Many of them had multiple, you know, prior to becoming homeless, during homeless and even beyond homelessness, you know, you know multiple, multiple traumas. Uh, and what happens is, sorry if I'm waffling on a bit too much, what happens is um, they try and reach out to services. Uh, services will often say, you know, I think um, Paul was right when he was saying about, I can't remember the phrase you used, institutional rejection. I like that phrase. It's a very good phrase. So what happens is they, they go to services and because of where they're from, they're homeless, whatever, uh, they're often labelled as depressed, anxiety, and also as addicts. These things aren't seen as a, as a whole. They just seem as separate. Um, you know, and there's a bit of a bias there in terms of, of that. And then what happens then, the treatments offered don't address the underlying trauma therefore treatments offered aren't always effective um because they're meant to have this based on trauma that's not all services i'm not just painting everybody like that that is just a more sort of traditional way that people are treated um so yeah it's a massive issue in in their lives 
Cool. And and I think so just something you kind of said there, I think yeah. I think that within the homes of sector, there's this magic thinking that as soon as someone says they have a mental health issue, yeah. the worker thinks, right, well, you need to go to mental health services. And, yeah, and that's what you do. You're not yeah. compliant, you know, you're being difficult and everything. And yeah. actually, for many people, they recover without the need of the NHS effectively. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's kind of part of it. Now, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need the Adrians and the Costas of the world to kind of demonstrate that someone has experienced trauma and that is having a lasting impression because, you know, there's nothing within the law that says it has to be a consultant psychiatrist that says that Joe Bloggs is traumatised. But in the real world of approaching councils, you guys are effectively, you know, you provide this kind of framework, this kind of research based body of, of, of work from nice guidelines and wherever. And so Costas, I just wanted to ask you, you know, for, I've got a few questions. Um, I won't have time to ask them all, but in what sense, you know, Adrian's already touched on it, but in terms of those kind of those official psychiatric diagnoses, how does trauma cause them or, or you know, does co trauma cause them and, and how does it then kind of make things worse? So, so, so trauma is a significant contributor to the majority of mental, uh, mental, mental illnesses. And I think we need to think of trauma as uh, something that, uh, that is current so something that's happening in your life now and how this increases your risk of, of depression, of anxiety, of psychosis, uh, but also how trauma uh, is, is, is a thing that may have affected your development, your uh, experiences, uh, exposure to situations that, uh, that uh, are impacting on, on how you see life and how you, you engage with others, how you learn to trust others. And, uh, and this is, if you like, the long-term effect of, of, of being exposed to, 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 to traumatic, uh, adverse, if you like, situations as, as, as you're growing up. And uh, in, in, in terms of, 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 of risk for me, what's, what's, what's really shocking, when you see the numbers, uh, you see that, that, that homeless people die you know, women die 37, 38 years. The average age of death is 38 years. It's like half of your life expectancy. Uh, men as well, they die so much earlier. People are 20 times as likely to die from, from, from drug abuse. They are almost four times more likely to die by suicide and die younger by suicide. So, 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 so homelessness is a significant contributor to what is, to what is happening. And, and unfortunately, I, I agree with the issues around mental health. Sometimes mental health is seen as another, as another authority, as, 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 as another traumatizing you know, uh, service that's more concerned about the eligibility criteria, who will see you, nine to five and you have to be here you know 10 past nine and if you miss your appointment uh, you're going to be discharged and uh, that's 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 really problematic and it does not really really help and i i agree if you are under mental health service you're actually a lot more likely to be helped but actually uh, you're more likely to need help possibly when you're not under mental health service because you you just cannot cannot engage with the with the standard processes so i've just got some quick fire questions for you costas like almost like yes or no so first things first someone with a dependent syndrome a diagnosis of dependent syndrome would it would it be fair to, to call it a lifestyle choice yes or no 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 thank you because that's something we see regularly with housing officers they kind of say that my next quick question is so for someone with with a significant mental health issue the fact that they're not engaging with with mental health support services does that mean they're at more risk of harm or less risk of harm they're at more risk of harm if not engaging cool. so we haven't got time to explore those things um, a lot but those are kind of some key things i see in, in kind of casework so it's just good to hear that from a consultant psychiatrist um I guess I guess another question, and I, and I I think Dave is itching to say something. I might be wrong there, but I just um, in in terms of the kind of the we not only have to understand trauma and its impact on someone's ability to deal with homelessness down the line, but we also have to try and convince housing officers who are often not very sympathetic. Now, 
in one sense, you know, you, you kind of reference nice guidelines and things like that a lot. Are there kind of some good sources that, that advocates can be using just to basically force the issue and kind of say, no, you know, uh, EUPD is a real thing. You can't just dismiss it as being like, a, you know, just, a, you know, whatever, which housing officers quite often do. So are, are there kind of some good uh, resources that people can be using to kind of to, to evidence that people are, are in priority need? I, I, I think when you go to the NICE guidelines, I think they can be quite, quite helpful because they, they do set up standards of care that, that they are easy to reference. MIND is very, very good uh, resources as well regarding, regarding mental health and some really good guides and guidance about what, what is uh, a condition and how it should be, it should be, it should be treated. Cool. Okay. I mean, um, it might be we can get some resources out on that, just some some key ones, because some of the stuff you shared with me was almost like, I mean, it was kind of it was using terminology like self medication, which again is is quite often dismissed by housing officers. They're like, oh, you know, that's not a real thing. I've even worked with housing officers who are like, oh, you know, autism that wasn't a real thing when I was growing up, and that, that kind of attitude. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Um. So yeah, yeah. So that that's really cool. I just wanted to come to David. Now, David, you were involved in the research around hard edges. I'm sure you've got various bits to say. Is there anything that you're kind of picking out so far that kind of ties in with what we're, where we're going? So thanks, Mike. Um, I, I want to pick up on a couple of points, actually, for um, uh, and just to clarify with everyone, equally, we are peer-led. I mean, it's meant uh, a multiple disadvantage, severe multiple disadvantage. Um, and it was interesting what Paul said about uh, acceptance of those orders. So when you're being told something, and also the way that you present at local authorities. So for those of you who don't know, I was in the care system, it was extremely abusive. I joined the army, I've been an active service, I had one of care out there, I spent 20 years on front. I'm known to the criminal justice system, um, I'm known to um, mental health services as well, because I've tried to take my life a couple of times. I remember what the day that I presented at my local authority saying, can I have some help? Um, first thing is I did try and tidy myself up a lot. Um, I accepted um, their decision. Their decision straight away was no. Um, at, there was no conversation. It was just no um, on your way. Um, but I, uh, and I just accepted that. But I remember what the impact on me afterwards, recognising I've been through quite a lot as a kid in childcare, recognising I've been on active service, recognising I've been caught in the criminal justice system and all sorts of things like that. So I've been quite challenging places actually that the walk from that local authority to the place where I went and found the dark corner on a sack was probably one of the worst times of my life absolutely so the impact of saying no to, to someone who's suffered from trauma um uh, it is it's severe and, and, I, and I think that you know recognizing as well that Trauma can be anything to anyone, can't it? It could be, a, 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 you know, maybe you wake up in the morning, get down and your goldfish has died. It's about what support and resilience you've got uh, um, uh, built up around you and have you. When we did, went out and did Hard Edges in, 2000, I think it was 2015, um, we went around the country trying to um, uh, measure multiple disadvantage and look at the impact of, uh, on local authorities and, uh, and what have you. I guess the idea was to look at the numbers and um, uh, not just in individuals, but the uh, numbers in cost for local authorities and national government. But the most interesting thing that came out of it, as we went around to uh, country and spoke to um, an awful lot of people uh, in groups and singularly, um, it was that question at the end was, where do you think this started? And without hesitation, people were going, childhood, childhood, childhood. And it wasn't just care systems, it wasn't, you know, um, it might have been dysfunctional families. It might have been dyslexia um, back in the day where it wasn't recognised and you've got a beating at school for being thick and not paying attention. When you, then you got home and you got another one from your father for not doing school and what have you. So all of these sort of things. But 85% was such a staggering amount of people, um, a percentage of the people we spoke to without... It was just automatically childhood, childhood, childhood. Uh, and we're not recognised. I think that was a challenge and that was something we're not recognising. And it's interesting, actually, when we're talking about how people present. And, uh, and actually, um, uh, I still suffer from mental illness. Um, 
Uh, and, and when I work with people in the past, it's uh, you, you com you're comparing things often to them on a good day. On a good day, yeah, they can put their trousers on, they cook themselves a meal. Yeah, but how often are the good days? And what happens on a bad day? But we don't talk about that, or well, the system doesn't seem to want us to talk about that. It's very keen on what, what, what you're best at, but actually, uh, on a bad day, and it's the bad days are the ones that, that are important. I don't, I've gone way off your question, I think, uh, uh, Mike, but Th that's those quite are just all right. I mean, I think just, just, just something you said there, and also Paul said earlier, just about because in one sense you know the, the law is incredibly complicated but in my experience people have been homeless and they've been told they're not in priority need whilst they might not know exactly what section they've you know they they you know they aren't but they they know it they they kind of have they walk away knowing they've been screwed over and in one sense they you know unless there's a good service out there you know and the, there aren't a lot of them around now they are going to they're, they're going to be left homeless and, and that kind of for me that kind of that that's an additional trauma now um there's a really good book by jonathan shay called achilles in vietnam which is a really weird title but it's about vietnam vets and kind of after the war and he makes the point that, that Vietnam vets seem to have a much harder deal in recovering because in one sense, what they were asked to do in the war meant they were kind of betrayed by authority figures. And, I, and he kind of goes on to kind of extrapolate that and to, you know, talk about where you've got abusive care systems and so on. It's not just the abuse itself, but it's the betrayal and the kind of the, the kind of the, the, the dishonesty of the authority figures that seems to make it more difficult to kind of come out of. So Paul, I've seen your hand, but David, go, go for it. So I, ironically, ironically, that the way that the place that I got help was from the community that were out there that knew the system, but didn't want to gauge this with the system because they didn't trust it. But they were the ones who taught me and showed me what I needed to do in order to get the help that I needed, but they didn't trust them to get to engage themselves. And, and I'm just going to throw it out there for me. If you're a, if you're if you're a paid homelessness professional, you need to know more than 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 clients. You know that your job is to know this system. So we need to be the ones who are kind of putting this stuff and making it easy for people as as easy as it can be. Um, Paul, um, yeah, go for it. I think what I wanted to talk about was um, in terms of this institutions concept. I also wanted to talk about institutions as buildings and objects in the sense of I don't think people fully appreciate how traumatic it is to walk into a bureaucratic place with lots of people in suits and paper, full of paperwork and computers and be questioned about, you, about your life and be asked in lots of in-depth stuff and about how much that feels like a repetition to people. And if and that's why I come to the point about their expectation is they're not going to get helped. So if your expectation is you're not going to be helped in the first place, how likely is it that you're going to be able, you're, you're going to agree to do it in the first place? You're going to want to do it in the first place. Secondly, how likely is it you're going to be able to do it without taking something to make the pain a bit less frightening before you go there. And thirdly, if you do, and then you get refused like David was talking about, then it kind of just conforms to what you've, what you, what you've always believed. So your trauma is reinforced. So the very thing that made you frightened of going in in the first place has now been reinforced. And the very pain that you were trying to avoid and asking for help to the very pain you're trying to avoid and yet whilst you're asking for help is, 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 is magnified. And so the cycle plays out again. And that's why people end up believing that the, the, the services aren't about helping them. And, it, and it, I just think things like having security guards there and, and, and having a kind and kind of having un, sort of unwelcoming where you're a single person so we don't we don't kind of help you all that kind of informal gatekeeping stuff that goes on is really really brutal on people that's what I wanted to say so I mean so I've got something to just to bounce off that Paul so uh, Adrian I saw your hand a second ago 
So just a little kind of little gem that if you're working in a, in a local authority area where they've got an open plan customer service centre and they expect you to answer questions about the abuse you've suffered in this open plan customer service centre, you can just straight up complain. It's, uh, services have to be data uh, protection compliant by default in design. That can never be secure. You can therefore, as an advocate, immediately get that changed. So in Bedford, they, know, they now use private interview rooms, which aren't the most welcoming of places, but at least you can actually talk about the most personal things that you're going to have to talk about in a place where you're not getting overheard by someone who's there to get their parking ticket sorted out or whatever so there are some again there are things that can be done doesn't solve everything but it is but it, there are, you know advocates do have that kind of power so sorry yeah, I just want, yeah i'm always going to talk about that sort of stuff if that comes up but adrian um go for it sorry i couldn't unmute just linking what um paul and david said particularly about the childhood um in my experience looking at the sort of trauma that, that people present um, yeah, childhood is the biggest one. And then, and about 40% of my clients talk about parental violence and neglect and being your parents being your parents, family being where you first see authority and first seek help. And, you know, that's where you learn, you know, what help is. Um, and then you go to like into these places where, uh, as Paul said, where they present as authority and make decisions about you. You're already like sort of like program to to expect rejection from the authority the authority figures and the people that help you so you just reinforce you're less likely to kind of fight back against it less likely to argue your case and as people have said more likely to accept it so that 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 lesson being learned so early in life can, can follow people through all their experiences we see it all the time which is you know um just want to say that Cool. And, and just and just a labour to point, like professional services get paid millions of pounds every year and we're supposed to be designed to deal with people who have these kind of experiences. So if we're not able to do that, if we're just cherry picking clients who are going to get our best outcomes because they're already stable or whatever, then then what <laughs> why are we here? Anyway, that's me. Um, Costas, go for it. So I, I, I was going to comment on on, on something that's frequently referenced around drugs and alcohol use. And uh, there is this part of the Mental Health Act that is saying that being dependent on substances does not constitute, uh, you know, a, a disturbance or disability of mind and uh, is not a mental illness under, under the Mental Health Act. And it's frequently quoted, and I have to say it's, it's not accurate because that's what it says about dependence, but uh, within, within the Mental Health Act, there is explicit reference to other illnesses, mental illnesses, for example, depression or anxiety, that are disorders of the mind and do deserve treatment, if you like, even if you believe that they are directly caused by drugs or alcohol, it does not make any difference. And also uh, in the same, uh, if like uh, paragraphs, it describes how you can treat people as long as you target, if you like the, the other mental illness and also conditions like intoxication or withdrawal are, are mental illnesses under the Mental Health Act. Therefore, this idea that, you know, oh, that's not mental illness, nothing to do with us is, 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 actually, is actually totally, totally wrong. Uh, there is this concept of dual diagnosis a bit out of favor, co-occurring uh, mental, mental uh, illnesses and substance uh, abuse. It's, 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 it's uh, universal. It is there all the time. People who drink alcohol, 80% will be, will be depressed. And they do require treatment and they do have to be offered treatment. And again, the expectation is that mental health services should be helping out, should be running the show, should be helping people and should be supporting them. and should be, if like approach uh, drug and alcohol services and make sure that the appropriate treatment is, 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 is provided. And, and one of the biggest uh, a relapse, if like indicators to substance use is exposure to stressors. So if you're homeless, you're not going to stop using substances because that's sometimes the only, the only thing that, that makes sense to you within the context of what is, of what is going on. 
So, so addressing all these things is the only way to make to make a difference in people's lives. Cool. And and I'm I'm, I'm hearing from that cost as well. Like mental health services are also potentially kind of turning people away because of the substance use and making it more difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, this is something that can and should be challenged by, by everyone involved in someone's care. So all you have to do is just reference that, you know, the, the national CPA policy that's currently in place that, that explicitly states when someone has a dual diagnosis, their care should be provided under the care program approach, unless a specific assessment suggests otherwise. And I don't think anyone is going to make an assessment and decide that this is not the case. So, so the expectation and mental health services should be challenged whenever they say, you know, go and stop drinking and then come back for us to treat your depression. That can be challenged straight away. I know it's not happening, but it can be challenged. Yeah, that's cool. The, the stuff I'm going to check out in the recording because there's a lot of information there. That's, that's very helpful. Um, Sarah? Yes, I, I just wanted to pick up on um, the, this uh, point about um, uh, whether or not addiction or substance misuse is, is uh, sort of deemed to be a, a mental health disorder or the way that it's treated in that way, because I think it underlines a sort of a, like a wider point that, you, that we often see where people are seen as, as being um, the, the question is asked almost whether or not a person is, is sort of morally responsible for their behaviour, uh, particularly in intentionality cases, when it's really not the job of a local authority to be a, assessing a per, the morality of a person's uh, behaviour or, or what they should or should not be doing. Um, but the, the other, the other uh, point that I wanted to make about this was that... Um, it's right that under the Equality Act, there is an exception for the, the definition of, of disability for uh, where, where a person is, is um, person's difficulties are, are to do with, with drug misuse. Um, in relation to mental capacity, actually, it's an open question. Um, the, the decision, that, there was an issue which was referred to the High Court recently as, as to whether alcoholism could mean that it could be a dis disturbance of the mind such that a person lacks mental capacity by virtue of, the, of their alcoholism. It went to the, to the High Court and then the High Court didn't actually deal with it. So it means that this, this, is, this is still an open question. Um, but the, the broader point is that when we're looking at priority need at least, it's a functional test. We, the, 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 the local authority shouldn't be getting into the sort of medical intricacies or moral or moralizing it should it should simply be asking about the way that a person is affected by the conditions that that make life difficult for them and and really it should end there rather than getting into any sort of technicalities i suppose that's really helpful because obviously that's a very very common you know, kind of uh, culture you see within teams where, you know, it absolutely is seen as lifestyle choices. And that absolutely is seen as a, as a legitimate thing to do is to then deprive that person of housing because then, you know, they're not worthy of it. So that's really helpful. Um, I think I think Adrian was next. Just a, a quick point and um, linking kind of what the previous two people said. It, it, the thing about substance misuse, in my experience is um, if I see so many people who, and I'm not, I'm not diagnosing them, but would fit the criteria of, say, PTSD. We're talking about trauma here. So there's so many people who fit the criteria of PTSD. And some of, the, some, of the, some of the criteria of PTSD are things like depression, intense anxiety, but also um, use of substances right, is a very common part of PTSD. Now, if, if they're homeless, people weren't diagnosed as or, or seen as being anxious or depressed or whatever eupd whatever and we're choosing substances because of a moral position or as, as you know or because they were um you know lifestyle choice or whatever um but if we saw it as a kind of overarching thing they have they have a post they have a they have a condition which is based on trauma a post-traumatic sort of stress disorder if we saw it as that and i think there is a sociological bias in diagnosis of, of homeless people they don't tend from what I've seen, they don't tend to be diagnosed with PTSD as much as other parts of society. And if they were diagnosed with PTSD, maybe 
I'm not saying they've all got PTSD. That's not what I'm saying. If they were diagnosed with PTSD, perhaps it would be seen in a different light. Um, but their addiction is always seen as this kind of moral choice or, oh, they just do it because they're homeless. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, and so it's kind of, it reinforces this idea that it's their fault. So, you know, I think that's, a, that's an important issue that, you know, could probably be dealt with. Yeah, and I'd say, and I'd say like, so I remember um, we, we saw a decision where this kind of reasoning was in there, you know, like suddenly relapse is always a lifestyle choice. And as well as challenging the decision, we complained about the fact that an officer was saying that in writing and, and they haven't used that reasoning ever since. So it's something, again, advocates can be, can do something about. It's not just like, you know, kind of shrugging and saying, well, there's nothing we can do. Um, David. Just quickly on me. Um, as an ex-user, I can tell you it was not a lifestyle choice. And when I first used it, it was about what was going on in my head. It was the trauma. It's the way that I managed it. Um, Mike, I, 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 so a couple of things. I'm conscious of time. And I've just seen um, a, a question in the um, chat that I wanted to pick up on. And it, if I can, and try and answer it. Um, it was about somebody's been there but working for charity, come across people who think that local authorities not set up to help them and have distrust. Um, so uh, I think there's gatekeeping. Um, how do I speak to these clients at all to convince them of this and uh, or, or getting some help from the local authority when the, the, the local authority is the only place that they can go? I just want to share something really, really quickly. So um, uh, in 2010, I set up a, a, my own advice and guidance clinic and became an advocate. And Mike's mentioned advocate many times because I think this is really important here. Um, uh, I set up an advice and guidance clinic and I ran it out of, um, I nearly said pret a manger there, and I'm sure I'm not supposed to say it, but I ran it out of one of those in the middle of a, a high street. And I ran it for four years and it was funded for two by my local authority. And the reason being is, and this would be the thing for people, if you're trying to convince people to go up, what I used to do is I used to work with people to co-produce their pathways. I would go to the local authority we would be a team, I would stand with them. When we weren't, we celebrated together. If we didn't get what we wanted, we'd console each other, but we'd rethink it through and support one another to get through that process. The important bit there is standing with someone, especially when they've not had people standing with them in the past and they've been on their own, which is probably where a lot of people have been. And if it was me doing that right now, I would have taken notes on all of the stuff that Sarah said, and Costa said about nice, and I'll be using that in my armory when I went up there. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, I couldn't agree more with you. And uh, I'm always interested by professionals who kind of blame victims of domestic abuse, for example, they say, well, you know, you should have left before. And I'm like, you you don't even dare to challenge your local authority. Yeah, you don't even dare to challenge them. How on earth is your client going to challenge an actually dangerous person? You know, just there's a there's a lack of perspective there. David, you're absolutely right. We're, we're, time is getting on. We're obviously going to overrun by a few minutes. So I really apologise that for everyone. There's one more thing I just wanted to, to point. I wanted to say, and in order to make the point, David, are you okay just to give a brief um, explanation of what true co-production is? Because I want to make a point going back to trauma on that. But you're 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 the expert. Oh, <laughs> um, so. Um... So often, so there's loads of stuff about co-production in there, and often what we hear um, is that it's all very complicated and stuff like that. But actually, if we genuinely talk about co-production, it's about the way that we work. It's about the way that we work, walk into our workspace, the opportunities that we give um, to, to people and the way that we do our work. So we've got sort of three little simple principles is that um, recognising that we don't own the monopoly on the truth, but the truth sits within the collective. So whether that's a group or just two people, it sits within the collective. And that's where the wisdom and the power is. So you, you work together, you're not coming to that space saying, I know everything. The other one is that we have, um, you afford all stakeholders the opportunity to sit at the table. So it's who's going to be involved in this or who's, who's this going to affect? Well, they need to be sat here inputting and sharing their wisdom to them. Let's do it equitably. Uh, and the third thing is about taking a strength-based uh, uh, approach rather than, so that the system is really good at like being deficit-based uh, and prescriptive, um, and not in a positive way, prescriptive at you, not for you, for would imply that it's good for you, but scripted at you, it's like, as for them, it's better for them. Actually, we need to take um, a strength-based approach. It's about everybody working together, you know, sharing all of their wisdom, all of their learning, all their strengths and their skills to come out with the right outcomes. 
in the, that's the short like one minute version <laughs> that's awesome so the reason the reason i, I mean uh, the reason i wanted to kind of mention it in this discussion is that so so i've you know i've been to conversation co-production i've seen david at work i've been to the training and stuff like that he does and for me there's something very special about the way he approaches all of this stuff so for me conventional charities where you've got hierarchies you've got professionals you've got clients they are they are by definition restricted in in kind of creating social settings whereas true co-production when i've seen david do it because that that hierarchy is removed you have people who are currently homeless or have been homeless and they are genuinely in a position to actually make friends because it's not you know it's not you're just a charity case you're doing useful things with um you know with other people and you're kind of getting to know people it's a really good way to get to know people the reason i say it here is that for me no matter how good the Costas's and the Adrians of the world are in dealing with you know therapy and that kind of stuff, for me, unless people who've been through trauma have a social base, you know, real friends, you know, kind of underpinning that kind of therapy, you know, it's very it's very difficult for a mental health professional to really kind of you know to kind of, to be much help. And so for me, there's also a challenge in this. If you want to respond to trauma, charities need to get their heads around real co-production. They need to give up some of their power, and they need to create these environments where people can be on be be on equal footing with them to 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 kind of create 